I am Ann Applebaum. This is the Legatum Institute. I run a program here called Global Transitions. Um, and among other things, we've had several projects in or on uh, Libya. Um, this evening's uh, event is a very interesting one because it combines, it, we have three very different, three very distinguished and interesting people on one panel um, with extremely different perspectives on Libya from, from, from different points of view. Um, and we're going to um, hear from each of them um, in, in turn, the sort of the, the proximate cause of the event um, is a paper that we commissioned from Mark Dempsey, who's on the end. Um, Mark is a very experienced banker who's worked in banking across Europe and the Middle East. Um, most importantly, from our point of view, he served as an advisor to the Iraqi Central Bank between 2008 and, and 2012, and so had firsthand experience of how you run major financial institutions and reform major financial institutions at a time of very volatile uh, politics uh, and security um, crisis. Uh, we commissioned him to write about, with his sort of hat on and his, and his experience in, in Iraq, we asked him to go to Libya and spend a few weeks there and to write a report on financial reform. And, and really, it's a, in, in fact, it turned out to be a report largely about how to kickstart the private economy in Libya. Um, and I'm going to ask him to say, well, he'll start by speaking a few, few words about that. Um, in addition to Mark, we have Fatima Hamrush, who is a former Minister of Health uh, in the Libyan transitional government from 2012 to 20, 2011 to 2012. Um, she got that appointment because she had been a prominent and influential member of the Libyan diaspora opposition, um, among other things working as the head of um, Irish Libyan emergency aid. And you will actually discover that one of the oddities of this panel is everyone on it is Irish. Um, as well as being, in some cases, Libyan. So, um, and we'll, we'll ask her to speak a little bit about her experiences and, again, to reflect on some of the problems that, that Mark will bring out. Um, the third member of the panel is Mary Fitzgerald. Um, to anybody who follows Libya, she's a, a well-known name. She's the foreign affairs correspondent of the Irish Times, an award-winning journalist. I won't list all of her many awards. Uh, it would take the rest of the evening. Um, but she's worked all over the world, especially in the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia. She spent several months in Libya following the 2011 revolution and returns there regularly. She's done some outstanding research on Libya's Islamist milieu for a forthcoming book on that subject. She's returning to Libya next year um, in December for another year to work on that project, um, among other things. Um, so everyone, as you can see, has a different perspective and from a different piece of different point of view on Libya, and that's on purpose. Um, and, but I'm going to ask now Mark to begin. Um, he, his paper is available here, and it's available, will be eventually available on our website. Um, and we asked him, as I said, to go and have a look at the central bank and to look at the banking sector in general mm -hmm. with an eye towards understanding why the, uh, the economy is taking so long to kickstart in Libya and why, in particular, uh, the private sector is moving so slowly. Why is there so little investment? Why are so few companies being formed? Um, and anyway, so Mark, ple please begin with, with, a, with a brief brief discussion of your paper. Okay, well, thank you very much, John. Um, before I start, I'd like to just welcome everyone this evening. Given it's so close to Christmas and it's a weekday, it's great to see such a large number out. Um, secondly, thank you very much to everyone here and for Mary and Dr. Armouche attending. They're far more illustrious than I am, for starters. Um, and secondly, their association with Libya is much longer. Um, the reason I think I got the commission was I'd done work in Iraq. Um, and at the time, I would have thought it was quite similar in its, in its setup in that it's, um, it's a country reliant on its oil revenue. And um, it's coming out of a very centralized rule, like decades of centralized rule. But I'm afraid that's where the, the parallels kind of stop. Um, and the first thing that I recognized when I went over there and talked to various people in the sector um, is that any association with Iraq is deemed very negative. So I think after the first conversation, I took Iraq out of the title. I took oil investing out of the title. I took the LIA part out of the uh, paper altogether, primarily because the LIA is very much an independent body. Um, it's got full discretion over the management of oil revenues, and um, whereas in Iraq, the central bank actually looks after, has the discretion to manage oil revenues. 
and also has a large say in the management of the development, what is known as the, formerly known as the Development Fund of Iraq. Um, so I have written a relatively long speech in advance of today, but ultimately I'm going to keep it very short. Um, and I've sort of condensed it into four main areas, five main areas. So there's governance, the need for a property registry, the need for a credit bureau, um, the development of banks um, that has different questions associated to which I'll get to it, and then Sharia finance. Um, so the first one is governance. Um, this is quite an easy one to approach in a way because the, the lack of governance is so prevalent in, in Libya. And whoever I spoke to, both central bank people, well, relatively few because a lot of the, a lot of the appointments were cancelled at the last minute, whatever that says. And then there were various private sector people and then there were government folk, um, MPs, and a couple of journalists from the financial sector. Um, the main issue with governance is that the private sector believes they're never going to be taken seriously, or their interests are never going to be at, um, kept at heart because um, there's too much cross-sector ownership. So you have, for example, members on the board of the Central Bank of Libya also owning stakes in semi-state banks. And this means, of course, that there's a concentration of services towards those banks rather than private sector um, entities. Um, this came up again and again, um, and the fact that this governance doesn't exist leads any calls, leads any advocacy for reform on behalf of the central bank um, deemed as disingenuous. Um, so, with respect to the private sector, um, I'm just going to quote a couple of statistics related to the need for jobs. So, where Michael Cousins, editor of the English language daily Libya Herald, highlights the size and urgency of the task facing the government. Libya's population growth is at 1.75% per year, and it's expected to continue at the same level for the next five to 10 years. Of the present population, half is under 20 years of age. That means, in addition to the 860,000 jobs needed now, Libya has to create at least 150,000 a year for the next five years. Without those jobs, discontent will rise and security will be at risk. Um, and when you look at the actual figures, Ministry of Labor's, the Ministry of Labour put the unemployment figure at 15%, although unofficial estimates suggest the real figure is closer to 30%. And of the unemployed registered with the Ministry of Labour, 43% are, are university graduates. So, looking at the economy in general, um, the Libyan Revolution cast into stark relief the economic inadequacies as well as the political inadequacies of the Gaddafi regime. Although Libya had been on a steady up upward economic trend following the lift of UN sanctions in 2003, economic activity has in had increased steadily for seven years since 2010, when average real GDP growth was approximately 5%, with the CPI averaging or consumer price infla inflation averaging less than 4%. Official foreign assets increased from $20, 20 billion dollars uh, to the end of 2003 to 170 billion at the end of 2010. And then the question is, yet yeah, Libya was then, and still remains, one of the most hard to carve dependent states in the world, with its exports among the least diversified in the world. Oil revenue accounts for over 65% of GDP and 95% of revenue. The dependencies on hydrocarbons makes economic performance vulnerable to oil, oil price shocks. As in Iraq, it also makes government forecasting and fiscal management very difficult. So therefore, economic diversification is absolutely a matter of urgency, and therefore the private sector comes into play. Um, I have various questions related to oil production, but I don't have time to cover them, unfortunately. Um, the CBL, the Central Bank of Libya, is the main body that oversees the financial sector. Um, it has an official status of an independent and autonomous body with the governor, and has definitely been appointed by the GNC, or the General National Congress. The current governor is Mr. Sadiq Al-Kabir, and he was chosen by the National Transitional Council, which preceded the GNC. And he is still in power to this day. The financial system itself is made up of 15 commercial banks, the ma majority of which are state or partially state-owned, four specialised credit institutions, five insurance companies, and a recently established stock market. Fully private-owned banks include Amman Bank, the biggest of the private banks, which has a strategic joint partnership with Banco Espirito Santo from Portugal. There is also Asaraya Trade and Investment Bank, a wholly-owned, private-owned institution, and advisory service companies like Arcon Capital, an investment banking group which recently brought out Tripoli-based investment company, al Arashad. Now these smaller advisory groups have formed in the aftermath of the revolution and typically their founders were Libyan Americans, Libyan British who returned to Libya in the last couple of years. Um, in terms of their business, most of it seems to be trade finance related. 
because they can't really do much else. And this is another issue with the private sector banks who have a huge surplus of capital, which they can't really use. So what they do is they lay it overnight to the central bank, earn their 1% interest, when they really should be lending out into the market. But the incentive to lend isn't really there. Um, now, it's not there because of two major factors. Um, the lack of a property registry, which is a, a legacy from the Gaddafi era, and the lack of an in independent credit bureau, um, which I'm going to go to now. So bankers in Libya view the lack of a clear property title and the need for a reorganization of property rights as the most important constraint in the development of the private sector. The lack of property title constitutes a structural problem that, is that the government, rather than the central bank, is responsible for. The resulting ambiguity stops banks that have surplus liquidity from lending to the public at large and small and medium-sized enterprises amongst other sectors of society. Um, I'm not going to go into the complete explanation of the various implications of not having a property registry. I think most of you are probably aware of it, and it will be discussed in the ensuing discussion. Um, however, certainly the private sector sees it as something that hasn't been tackled as it should have been um, thus far, and particularly when it comes to compensation for the original owners. Um, and they're because of the, very, the impasse in politics at the moment, it's been pushed further down the line. And when, you don't, when that isn't approached the way it should be approached, everything else stops. Um, in addition to the lack of legal clarification around property rights, the lack of a credit bureau restricts banks from having the data to make risk management decisions on potential barriers. Um, this isn't really surprising across the Middle East because there's very little data or historical data for credit bureaus in the MENA region. I think Egypt is to an exception to a degree. Um, however, that said, there was, with the partial liberalization of the financial sector in 2007, um, Dun & Bradstreet, the international credit registry firm, for want of a better way of describing them, were brought into Libya to set one up. Um, so the foundation is there for a proper data record center. Um, and my other major points would refer to the, the recent announcement by the governor for an Islamic finance law, or at least for all institutions to deal solely in Islamic finance. Um, the reaction in general has been pretty negative, particularly from the private sector. Um, there's no doubt that there is a market for Islamic finance in Libya, but not yet because of the expertise in that isn't at the institutions. Um, so the governor has called for exclusive Islamic financing to be the only form of financing as he brought in in 2015. I think the consensus after speaking with people is that um, the capacity isn't there at the institutions and they would, they would prefer for a dual banking system, as in a regular banking system and an Islamic banking system to to be allowed to work together. Um, in terms of when Islamic financing could be brought in as a sole um, banking possibility, they say it would have to be as, as far as 2018, if the governor is going to keep pushing it, but it seems unlikely that he will. I'm sure you all have your opinions on this. Um, the IMF appears to echo the common consensus that there is no need to rush implementation of the law. Bank capacity to deal exclusively as an Islamic financial institution is not in place, so time will be needed. Um, Bloomberg says the same. While the 2000 member GNC didn't order banks to stop giving out loans, banning interest left lenders scrambling to find Sharia compliant alternatives. <coughs> um, at this stage, I think I've come to my end. Um, so thank you for listening. Thank you, Mark. Um, Minister Hamrush, you know, one of the things that really struck me when reading Mark's paper was how much ambiguity and indecision has been allowed to persist in Libya. You know, the, the, the fact of the, 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 you know, there doesn't seem to be anybody pursuing the, the, the registry of land. Um, there is, you know, the, these, these strange overlaps between the private sector and the public sector, people own, being somehow part of both, um, have been allowed to continue. Um, there's a lack of decision making. Um, things, things that ought to have happened two years ago don't happen. Um, I know that you were a minister you were in the transitional government at a, at a very crucial moment. You know, can, can you talk a little bit about wh uh, why the delays, why the difficulty in making decisions, um, and why these issues of governance and conflict, why, is it, why does it seem so hard to resolve them? Thanks for asking me the question. Um, see, when the revolution um, started, a lot of the people who were in the leaders' positions and managers of uh, even at the level of the Ministry of Health, for example, they were all uh, being let go. And um, the second line of people who were in place didn't have much knowledge of what was going on before they came So there was place. a lack of continuity. Yeah, there is a lack of continuity. And unfortunately, uh, 
um, they didn't have much information about what the ones before them were doing. So that's, that created a, a vacuum there that um, made it really, that word ambiguity is, is the right word to use because uh, um, a lot of them didn't even know that the, um, the business they were part of. Uh, add to this, there were um, lots of safes that were stolen, uh, looted during the uh, revolution, and they had in them contracts, they had in them a lot of uh, info that nobody knows about even now. Mm -hmm. um, now, the decision or the, the, as you mentioned earlier, the um, uh, indecision that's there at the moment is uh, is caused by many factors. One of them is this one, that the people who are there in power or in place, a lot of them don't have any idea of what has been there before them. Uh, on top of that, there's a lot of pressure from uh, armed militias um, or armed people. If you, we don't like the use of word of militia, really. People get offended from using that word. But in general, people think or f a lot of number of, a lot of people of them think that Let's speak up a little bit. <laughs> sorry, am I, am I not too high? Sorry. A lot of uh, the armed people uh, feel that they've been denied their rights before the revolution and they're trying to force um, many decisions by the decision makers that a lot of times these decisions aren't really well studied and uh, even the, uh, uh, the decision of changing the banks into uh, Islamic banks. It's, as you said, it's uh, the date for 2015 is, is a bit premature uh, and uh, it's under pressure that has been, the reason that it has been issued that yeah. way. So that's so many of these decisions are, I believe it's part of the transition after a long time that um, only few were decision makers in the country and most of them have gone, uh, they're bound to be uh, confusion. You said something interesting earlier when we were speaking um, before this panel. You said that it was a system set up to be run by one person. Yeah. And that's made it difficult for people. I mean, can you, can you maybe talk specifically about the health ministry? How did that, how did w w w you arrived there? Um, you yeah. Know, wh you know, what, what did you find? And, and what, you know, what, 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 what was most difficult for you in the beginning? Um, first thing, as I mentioned earlier, the people who were running the administrations or the managers of the administrations, most of them weren't aware of what has been there before them. Right, sure. But that's, I just mentioned now, but there is another issue that I realized in the middle of our term around March. Um, the laws and regulations that are there in the country are the same as the ones that have been there during the Gaddafi regime. They weren't changed. So uh, although the revolution has happened, but we still were running the, with the same regulations and laws of the previous <coughs> system, and they were all designed in a way <laughs> that the minister, for example, hasn't got a full uh, power to make decisions and uh, implement them. They have to go first to the um, um, prime minister at the moment, uh, which who, is, who is the head of the um, um, something very parallel to the uh, government. And also, uh, many of those decisions have to bypass even that person and be made by Gaddafi himself. Mm -hmm. And if they weren't, you have to go through the uh, general auditors first, and <coughs> that wouldn't be, uh, that would delay all decisions in particular if, if they are to do with financial uh, um, issues. Um, the only way to avoid that delay is to bypass all this through by going directly to the uh, to Gaddafi, who wasn't there, and the new regime didn't want to uh, make decisions by one person. So it it became really like going through circles. We weren't able to um, we weren't able to work fast enough. Mm -hmm. How how could what could have been done differently? At that what time? could have been done, and I still even even now I think it's been delayed. Uh, really quite uh, for a long time is to review all the previous regulations and rules and adjust them to the new t new uh, period. Um, that's one. Also to review the, l the uh, judicial system as well hasn't been done. The uh, constitution hasn't been made yet as well, which is the re what regulates the country's uh, laws in general. So 
in that, with those... So there's a kind of legal vacuum. Yes, there is a legal vacuum. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, of course, the, uh, the armed people who are still un un not fully controlled. Right. Thank, you, thank you. I will now turn to Mary. Um, you have been involved in Libya um, more recently. Can you g uh, g give us some idea where this is going? Do you see an end to this period of ambiguity? Do you... Um, you, know, it w you know, will we in February when, when, you know, by the time, by which time there's meant to be a constitution in place, do you see a, a some, do you see any kind of closure? Or is this the permanent problem of this, you know, are we going to have this problem for a long time? Well, a couple of things. Um, I uh, got an interesting comment from the Venezuelan economist Federico Alves last week, I think. He responded on Twitter. I tweeted something about Libya and he responded, um, with a tweet of his own, and he said Libya, um, as he put it, is a, a state in a non-state state, which I thought was a, an interesting way of, of putting it. You know, we're, we're talking about a country here, was struck earlier looking at the Institute's, uh, Institute's Prosperity Index, which some of you may already have seen. And Libya is not actually featured in that index. It's the only country in the Middle East and North Africa, apparently because the data that would enable the Institute to include Libya in the index is not available when it comes to Libya. So that gives you a sense of, of the challenges that are being faced here. Um, Libya, starting from scratch, is, as most of you will know, in, in so many respects. But I think those of you who've been following Libya closely in, in the last few weeks um, will know that several uh, things have happened that seem to be giving some sense of momentum in the country. There's a lot of talk about uh, the events of, of recent weeks presenting a unique opportunity now for the government to, to take. And of course the question is whether it will be able to do that or not. Those events are, for those of you who haven't been following, um, what we saw on November 15th in Tripoli, uh, which was basically the bloodiest day since, uh, since Tripoli fell in August 2011. 43 people killed when protesters confronted militiamen um, in a neighborhood of uh, Tripoli. And what was interesting about this particular incident is that the response to the killing of these protesters managed to unite several different forces and factions in Libya, um, from religious authorities to uh, politicians and other militias, and of course the ordinary people of Tripoli who said, enough, <coughs> we want the militias out of, of our city. Now this was a call that had been made several times over the last year in particular. But the impetus that the deaths of those 43 people gave to this call was, was very interesting. We saw on Monday, just this week, clashes between uh, the army and Ansar al-Sharia, which is an armed group based in Benghazi, which some have accused of involvement in the attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi last year, which killed the U.S. ambassador Christopher Stevens. At least nine people died as a result of those clashes. And what we're seeing in Benghazi now amongst the ordinary people of Benghazi is again a call. It's not a new call in Benghazi, just like it wasn't a new call in, in Tripoli, but a call for the militias to leave. Enough, people are saying. Um, so all of this is creating this interesting momentum on the ground, this sense that ordinary people in Tripoli and Benghazi are reclaiming something and basically saying, we want action on this problem. We see the problem of the armed groups and militias, uh, armed groups in Libya called the militias. As Fatima mentioned, uh, some people in Libya have a difficulty with the, with the M word. Um, but these armed groups, many of whom uh, sprung up during the 2011 uprising, but many of whom actually sprung up afterwards. Um, and uh, so now you have a constellation of armed groups throughout the, the, the country that are hampering a lot of, of the progress that Libyans would have hoped to have seen uh, since uh, the fall of, of Gaddafi. So there are all kinds of questions. There's a lot of political intrigue in, in Tripoli right now. Uh, what's going to happen? What's going to be the fallout from this? Um, will the government grasp that momentum and, uh, and run with it? Uh, will Prime Minister Ali Zaydan, who's already considered a weak Prime Minister before these recent events, will he be able to exploit that momentum? Um, a lot of questions. I have to say there's a lot of skepticism uh, over Prime, uh, Prime Minister Ali Zaydan's ability um, to, to run with this opportunity that has been presented. Uh, there's talk in, in Tripoli about uh, a possible rescue government, uh, a government of, of national unity, 
So there's all kinds of intrigue and, and all kinds of, of questions. But one point I want to make, though, which I think is, is crucial in terms of understanding a lot of uh, the issues in Libya right now is the tension uh, between the, the center, Tripoli, and, uh, and the regions, the periphery. And this dynamic feeds into so much of the challenges Libya uh, faces right now, from the federalist uh, challenge in eastern Libya, those who are seeking some form of, of semi-autonomy for the eastern region, and I'm sure we'll get into that a little later during the Q&A. Also, the relationship between Tripoli and Misrata. Misrata, a very prosperous uh, coastal town which played a, a significant role during the 2011 uprising and has managed to use the, the political leverage that it achieved as a result uh, to its advantage um, in, in Tripoli. What's interesting is that when we talk about economic uh, development in Libya right now, what I'm struck by is how the issue of the center versus the periphery feeds into that because while, as, as Mark outlined earlier, um, in Tripoli, when it comes to the central government and the obstacles um, that they face in terms of formulating economic policy, what's interesting is that when you go to towns like Misrata or even Benghazi, you see that those towns are actually doing things for themselves. Um, they are, uh, you know, there's, there's a hive of economic activity in, in Misrata, for example. Anybody who was in Misrata during the 2011 uprising and saw what the city was reduced to, the amount of destruction uh, done to the city, and now to see it, it's, it's a city reborn. It's, it's really quite impressive. Benghazi, for example, a city a lot of people associate with the, the series of assassinations over the last uh, 12 months, assassinations of of security officials, people uh, associated with uh, ex the rise of extremism, etc. But when you go to Benghazi, particularly over the last year or so, you'll see again there is a lot of very interesting economic activity happening, a lot of construction happening, um, a lot of new businesses opening, and all of that, uh, much of that is happening without any regulation or control coming from Tripoli. And, you know, there are pros and cons to that, I think. In, in Benghazi, I know that there are issues in terms of the amount of construction happening in the, in the city, people um, complaining that this is happening in an unregulated way. Um, to give an example further east uh, in Libya, the um, UNESCO protected site of Cyrene, the ancient site of Cyrene, recently was, was damaged uh, by people who moved in uh, with, with bulldozers. Um, who they were planning a, a development close by. So people are basically taking things into their own hands when it comes to economic activity, which I think is interesting. It's happening in an unregulated way. The but even, it even without property title, even without private property rights. Indeed, <coughs> indeed. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it again feeds <coughs> into the sense the, the, the tension between the center and the periphery. That the, the fact that you have a central government in Libya that is not able to impose its authority on the regions. Um, thank you very much, and that, gi that gives a that gives a um, you know a general a snapshot really of a very <coughs> complicated um, picture. Actually, if I can follow up on one thing, you know, one of the again, Mark's paper makes a lot of points about what needs to be done. You know, the separation of uh, you know separation of interests within the banking system. Um, you know, this property registry. What, you know, what do you think it would take? When do we, how do we get to a place where such reforms would be possible? What, what's necessary to, you, you talked a little bit at the beginning about galvanizing the country, and, but what's the institutional mechanism by which, can, what can you see happening next? Um, but by which we get to a moment where someone is in charge and can say, you know, it's illegal to be on the board of the central bank and on the board of four other banks. I mean, what, wh who's the person who could, who, who, could, who, could, who could take that decision? Well, if you look at the steps Libya needs to take, first of all, if you ask Libyans, and uh, there was a recent NDI uh, survey that showed the priority for Libyans is security, getting the security situation sorted out. After that, things will follow. After secu the security challenge, the political challenge, drawing up the constitution, forming the political institutions, and then after that, I think you can start talking about the economic institutions or the economic reforms that, that need to take place. I think it'll have to take those steps. Um, Mark, one of the reasons we asked you to look at Libya, even though your, your background is elsewhere, was Iraq was a country that also had an enormous security challenge. 
uh, you know, there was essentially an ongoing war and mm. an insurgency during much of the time when you were there. Um, nevertheless, there were banking reforms and there was um, lending. You know, we, uh, ca ca why was it possible mm -hmm. there and why, what's, well, the, what's the difference? Can you, I, can you focus I on that? I'm not sure there were banking reforms in Iraq that were very effective. I think it's much easier to do work in Libya because you don't have the whole private security sector environment. I mean, you can get to ATB from ATB very easily. I think that the will was there on behalf of the Iraqi governor and the central bank to implement reforms. He couldn't because Maliki stopped him. Um, and I see Mr. al Uzwi here in the audience. He experienced a similar experience to Governor Shabibi in that he implemented reform in the Trade Bank of Iraq and then quite suddenly there were trumped up charges and whatnot and he had to escape the country. Um, I don't think Libya is in a similar position. I mean, I think the biggest problem with Libya is the lack of political will. And I think it's very much a political issue. Um, Rather than a security issue. I think issue it's or politi poli political slash economic issue. Um, and I think, having spoken to people, I got a general dissatisfaction with the current policies of the current central bank governor, who they see as being very much removed from the needs of the private sector and the need for a private sector to, to, to exist at all um, in terms of the job creator. Um, and there was this huge disconnect. And I think I mentioned in the paper that in developed economies, the private sector is always engaged um, and approached um, as an advisor when bringing in new legislation or regulations. Um, again, speaking to private sector people, they're completely disengaged and they're completely alienated from any new policy implementations. So they're sort of told, you're going to have to um, abide by the new Islamic finance law. Tough. Uh, and that really creates a sense of alienation um, and resentment towards the central bank governor, if anything. Um, and I think, looking at the attendee list today, I see there's a lot of people involved in the capital market sector, um, advisor companies and whatnot. I'd be interested to hear your opinions and how do you think the current central bank governor, firstly, is he going to stay, um, which is very politically incorrect of me to say so, um, and secondly, um, if he does stay, do you think there will be proper, um, how would you say, um, reform to stimulate the private sector? I mean, I, again, I notice um, Ms. Abdul Hadi here in the audience from HSBC, you've written a number of pieces. Um, and the big question that she brings up is, you've got all these cash-rich cash rich banks. Most of them are deploying their capital, either placing it at the central bank on the overnight or doing trade finance. So no one's lending. Um, so, and the loans, to, the loans to deposit ratio is very low in Libya. I think it's the lowest in the region, at around 20%. So how do they deploy their capital better is the big question. And that's not something I'm really in a position to, to answer, but I feel there are some people in the audience that would have some ideas. But before, before we <coughs> turn to the, the, our extremely good audience, let me, let me ask you one other thing. Another thing striking about Mark's paper, he talks about the, there's a kind of prejudice in Libya, remaining prejudice against the private sector and a resistance to allowing the private sector to do things. Um, that's a little bit different from what, what you just said happens in the region. Was that your experience? What, what, and what kind of priority was economic reform um, in, that, in the period when, we, when you were in the government? Well, I must, uh, I'm sure uh, in your paper I, I noticed uh, you mentioned that there were regulations made by Gaddafi's, um, uh, or at, at Gaddafi's time, that uh, no more private uh, sector, basically. He's not encouraging, sp and that decision was made in the late 70s, I think, and includes includes the, uh, the law for um, uh, people sort of squatting in whatever house or, or, a bit or a property they were at and, and making it their own property. Uh, um, and that's what led to the uh, absence of the registry uh, for land or land registry in the country because a lot of people who are owning uh, property is not theirs from the start or has been sold to another person. And this is a major issue there because it's, it's generations, not in only one, uh, um, uh, one generation or two, it's about four generations in, in a row. Uh, uh, sorry, what, your, your first, your, would you remind I, me of I the... I'm interested in the, in the uh, what, what was economic reform oh. and economic construction a priority? Or was it not something it people focused on right away? I, I ask because I notice very often in the wake of major political changes, it's not the first thing people do, and maybe it ought to be. Well, the priority at the time uh, at the interim or transitional government was to maintain um, uh, sort of uh, an order in the country and um, 
of course, we, we, I can say it wasn't, we failed in doing that because the armed uh, people were, um, or almost everybody was armed, and um, that was not managed in the proper way uh, in terms of to, to take the arms from people, they had to be either part of the, they had to either deliberately or voluntarily uh, give their arms to the government or join the armed forces. Mm -hmm. And uh, of, of course there was no, uh, that created a problem for us because a lot of those who joined the armed forces weren't fit to join the armed forces and they added in to the uh, lack of security in the country. And because of that, it was very hard to even perform your day-to-day -day job in, in, in any, uh, either public, neither public nor private sector. I'm talking about the ministry, for example, we were raided many times by and people, the GNC as well has been, the, and the uh, uh, national and the transitional government, national transitional council was. So that delayed any. Uh, it's not the lack of political will that's uh, that's the cause for for the delay. It's actually the political will is there. It's the ability to to do what you what what the politicians are are. I mean to perform basically because of the interruption in the in, in doing the work uh, you get um, um, for let me just give you an example for example cont uh, re um, continuing the uh, projects that were s on stall at the time when I reached the, the government there there were about 750 uh, projects that weren't uh, were all put on hold so we, we chose the projects that were 50% and over, finished around 50% over. We couldn't start them because of the um, first, there's no security and any uh, builders who wanted to come couldn't come because of that. And uh, coming back to Mary's uh, uh, comment that without the security you can't, you can't proceed. Mm -hmm. So that's the main issue that caused all the delay and it's not, it's not the lack of the political will. Again, the um, to get the right person in the right uh, place, basically the expertise to do the um, t the job that's allotted to them, that's another issue. A lot of the people who are running certain sites were, were called to do the job that they weren't really familiar with mm -hmm. and weren't experienced uh, enough to do it. Um, I believe this is a temporary thing that should improve, but it's not a failure, it's, it's a transition stage and you, you're, you would expect that. Um, and again, I stress there is the political will is there. It's just the difficulties that we're facing with almost 90% of po the population armed. Um, I will now take some questions and comments. This is a, um, I, 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 I won't announce everybody who's here in the room. It's a very distinguished group in general. There are many people here who spend a lot of time in Libya, some who work in capital markets and banking in Libya. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd really appreciate questions and comments that, that can contribute to an explanation and also can help us think through, um, uh, you know, how, how can, you know, we in this room, how can people based in the West, based in London, be of use to Libya? What, what ought we to be thinking about doing? Um, what kind of advice can be, can be given um, if, we can, if, we can, if we can somehow push the conversation in that direction? Um, I, I open the floor. <laughs> right, lots of comments. Um, let's let's take three at a time. So one, um, the yellow collar, and then two and three. Please just say briefly your who you are <coughs> and your name. Sorry. My name is John Hamilton from Cross Border Information. Mark, um, early in your presentation, you you mentioned the the dependence that Libya has on its hydrocarbons mm -hmm. production, but of course at the moment they're not exporting much and, and may not for some time to come. And so, uh, as they, they look to, to, to government finance over the, over the next year um, and, and the need to, to write a, a new budget, it seems they're either going to um, have to cut their current spending or potentially dip into foreign currency reserves. So my question to you is, um, with your perspective on the management of the central bank and the way that its relationship with the government, I mean, how how difficult do you think this would be to achieve and, and what problems does, um, is it going to present in o o over the next few months? 
And then I suppose maybe d uh, just sort of because the, the blockades of the time was uh, to do with the, the, the conflict between the, the, the periphery and the, and the centre, I mean, you mentioned that. I wondered how, how you saw that panning out. Let me take another question as well. Um, maybe you, got your hand up first. I'm Jason Pack with Cambridge University. Um, I'm very flattered, of course, Mary, to hear you mentioning the center and the periphery, and you as well, John. And I want to ask a, a question to, you know, as you said, uh, carry the debate forward. Where do you see Islamist groups, the whole spectrum is of Islamist groups from the Brotherhood to Salafists to Salafi Jihadis, fitting in in the center periphery paradigm? Because, of course, on the one hand, the Islamists are spoilers I in the sense that they kidnap the prime minister, they support the political isolation law, which makes it impossible to consolidate power in the center or to have linkages between the center and the periphery. But yet on the other hand, they call for nationwide legislation and the implementation of things like Islamic banking, and they constitute themselves a center. So to put this forward, you could say, how do these groups benefit from the stall in lending? And I, I mean, I can give my own answers, but I'm going to ask you. And is that not at the crux of why people like the Grand Mufti and others benefit so much from the current banking system? Thank you. Uh, one more. Right on the aisle right there. Thank you. Uh, Porik O'Hanley from Libya Business News. Um, with regard to the property rights and, and the, the issue of the, the claims going back over, over decades there to uh, particular properties, uh, I'd like to ask if any of the panel can envisage uh, a methodology there that would be feasible and give a just result to the people involved and that, would, that, that we could implement and then move forward with uh, uh, into the future? Or, or is this just going to drag on for, for more decades? Thank you. Um, Mark, why don't you start with the hydrocarbon question? Um, yeah, that came up a lot um, with the people I spoke to. Um, and the reserves haven't been touched yet. Um, but the understanding was that they are accessible and that they're willing to access them if they need them. Um, with respect to the forecasting of the, budget, the budgeting, um, I think um, a lot of recommendations in the IMF were to create a single treasury account, consolidate all the accounts of the various governments, so they have transparency over what cash is actually available, and that will ease their forecasting methodology. Um. Uh, Mary, you've worked a lot on Islamist groups. Maybe you can speak to that. Sure. <laughs> well, first of all, just to address the, the question on the, um, on the oil blockades and uh, how it, it fits in with the, the federalist dynamic in, in eastern Libya. And I'm somebody who would argue that the, the federalist movement in eastern Libya has, right from the beginning, uh, overstated the level of its, uh, its support in eastern Libya. Um, I attended the very first meeting of the Burqa Council in March of last year, which was interesting for me because I uh, arrived back to my hotel <coughs> in Benghazi uh, later that evening and saw that the headline that went around the world about what had happened at the Burqa Council launch meeting was eastern Libya declares autonomy. I think some headlines said declares independence, which of course is not what happened. What happened was you had a gathering of about two or 3,000 uh, people from right across eastern Libya who got together and declared that they intended to seek a push for some form of semi-autonomy. And I think since then, the, some of the commentary, some of the, the media reporting of this issue has vastly overstated the federalist dynamic in, in eastern Libya. I would refer you to a, a study that was conducted by the University of Benghazi earlier this year that found 15% uh, of uh, Eastern uh, Libyans uh, surveyed said that they wanted a federal state. Which was, what was far more popular was a decentralized state. 62% of Easterners said they wanted an, a decentralized state. And the months I've spent on the ground in Eastern Libya, it's quite clear to me that there is a lot of, uh, when you ask people what they mean by federalism, um, there is a lot of kind of model thinking. It, it's difficult. People uh, tend not to have a clear definition of what it is. What is, is undoubtedly the case is that there are a whole range of grievances in legitimate grievances in eastern Libya. And the people put this label federalism. Federalism will, will solve all eastern Libya's ills. Um, I was in Benghazi on election day last year. 
And there has been some talk in co some quarters about the possibility in the future of, of having a referendum on the Federalist question in Eastern Libya. And I considered actually in many respects the elections last year as a referendum of sorts on federalism in Eastern Libya in that the Federalist movement in the East called on people to boycott the elections and people turned out overwhelmingly to, to vote in those elections. I can remember Benghazi that night, um, the crowds of people celebrating the fact that the elections had passed off relatively without incident. And one of the chants they were uh, making was basically, you know, federalists go to hell was the, the chant. Um, so all of that to say that I think that there is this sense that the federalist movement in eastern Libya is far stronger than what it actually is. It's a movement that has never really been a cohesive united movement. There have been several different factions. Um, and it's a movement that has fractured and splintered a lot in recent months. Um, I've been talking myself to several people who were quite prominent in it, in, la in the Federalist Movement last year. Now they are, are stepping back, they're retreating, um, they have real reservations over some of the tactics that are being <laughs> used, particularly the oil blockades, um, which they feel is, is basically cutting off your nose to, to spite your face. Um, a lot of people I've spoken to, again, were, were involved in the Federalist Movement last year, feel that the tactic of the oil blockades is actually causing strife in eastern Libya at a time when it, when it does not need it. Um, just on the issue of the, the Islamist groups, um, again, I think very often the, the issue of Libya's Islamists, a uh, lot of things tend to be conflated. Um, there is sometimes a perception that there is, a, again, a coherent kind of Islamist milieu in, uh, in Libya. Um, when in fact it's a, it's a very, very diverse uh, Islamist spectrum. It ranges from uh, the Muslim Brotherhood to um, uh, Salafists who were part of uh, jihadist groups in, in the past, including the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, who are now engaged in politics. Some of them are serving as deputy ministers um, in the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of the Interior in, in particular. Um, there are others, so these are basically former jihadists who have embraced politics. There are others who, like Ansar al-Sharia, uh, as we saw earlier this week, um, are basically uh, people who believe democracy to be inherently un-Islamic um, and say that they, uh, I recall interviewing the, the leaders of Ansar al-Sharia last year, just after the, the attack on the US consulate, and they explain that for them, what they're looking at is the constitution. The constitution is a priority for them. They say they will not give up their guns until they see a constitution that is based on Sharia. And of course, that begs the question, <coughs> what interpretation of Sharia? And I asked them, I said, what if Libya's future constitution is a constitution that is not as heavily based on the, your interpretation of Sharia as you would like? They had no answer for that. So. You're talking about a very, very diverse spectrum of Islamist groups. Um, sometimes I think there's a perception in Libya to dub Islamists of all stripes as Ikhwan, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, to conflate all those groups and, and, and uh, there's sometimes this impression that they're all working um, together and cooperating together. And this is something that we saw um, during the revolution as well. There was a perception um, I remember, particularly in eastern Libya, that the, the National Transitional Council, the NTC, um, many people claimed that the NTC was dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood, that the Muslim Brotherhood was controlling the NTC. We're hearing similar uh, claims now about the, the National Congress. But I think what happened with the NTC and what's happening with the National Congress now is that you have, yes, Muslim Brotherhood uh, figures working with people who are not part of the Brotherhood but share similar vision of, uh, of the future for, for Libya. Um, and they're forming interesting alliances within uh, Libya's uh, political institutions, including the National mm -hmm. Congress. Um, before I go to the property rights question, do you, do you have a view, uh, can you speak a little bit about your perception of the role of Islamic groups and Islamists at, you know, during the uh, period when you were in office and perhaps in the future? Yeah, I actually, yeah, sorry, the, uh, in general, uh, the Libyan population or Libyan people are moderate. They don't welcome extremism. So um, even the division 
of Ansar Sharia and uh, Muslim Brotherhood is frowned upon when it's uh, looked at in an extreme way. Basically, I met quite a large number of these people, and the, I th the media is, is magnifying the, the facts. Uh, some of them, although called, I'm not defending the extremists, but in general, they are labeled as Ansar Sharia or labeled as uh, Muslim Brotherhood, but they all they're looking, what they're really uh, hoping for is a country that um, uh, whose constitution is done in a moderate Islamist way, uh, and they are worried that if the con and that's that's where the uh, idea of not wanting to uh, um, hand over the arms until the constitution is is done is they they want to see a constitution that's uh, Islamic Islamic constitution but moderate, not extremist. Um, so uh, I don't really. Um, approve much of the of the idea that Libya is, is divided into um, some religious groups, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, or there are some who are there, but in, in general they are all under one umbrella that they want peace in the country and they want the country to be um, just all the laws based on Islamic uh, Sharia, but not if the they can agree on what that means. It, well, they're all agreeing on that, but uh, some are extremists. When, when, for example, the last uh, events that happened in Benghazi, uh, yes, uh, some some who were named as Ansar Sharia came on TV and and really uh, voiced very bad comments, saying that. Uh, um, we don't approve of the army because uh, it's it's not Islamist. But that's just an opinion of, of particular individuals. But it's not the general opinion of, of the majority that I've met. And again, that I don't want this to sound like I'm defending a particular religious faction. But what we hear in the news is not what we see on the uh, on the ground. Um, I believe that if if the safety and security in the country is well uh, controlled, most of these people won't be there. They won't, they won't have the arms. They will hand them over. Uh, I'm not trying again to simplify the whole lot. Um, there are some who are quite extremist, but very few. It's not the, the picture that is portrayed uh, in the news. Uh, I see something. You wanted to speak to this, is this to this point? Or to no. well, all right. Ha let's, have one, let's have a couple more questions. We'll come back to property rights as well. Oh, now there's him. So you, and then, and then in the front row, and then you. Thanks. Uh, my question to Mark. Um, I'm Mohammed from the Economist Intelligence Unit. Um, just wondering regarding the uh, regional oil firm that was launched in the eastern region by the uh, separatist movement. How likely is it to kick off and secure oil deals um, in 2014? And also, are you able to confirm whether or not there are plans for um, uh, a parallel central bank to be launched also in the eastern region? Because Reuters reported that. Answer. Yeah, I didn't hear that so well, but uh, as long as you heard it, that's fine. Um, um, or do I, let, let me yeah. take one, one other. Let, let me take the front row. Sure. Yeah. Laurie Anupdike Toller, constitutional legal historian. I, I wonder how much uh, of the property rights issues, and I agree that it's front and center in many of the minds. I've been asked to write on it several times and have not yet. Uh, how much of the property issues that Libyans are facing can be addressed constitutionally. Mm -hmm. Maybe one other, and then I also in the front row. And then I'll take some back, and then in the next one. Thanks. Christina Lamb from the Sunday Times. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Hamrish what she thinks about the moves in the last week to expel the militias from Tripoli, and whether she's optimistic that this is a turning point in the country. Um, <coughs> right, Mark, why don't you take the first question? It's going to be a pretty brief answer, I have to admit, Mohammed. Thank you for your question. Um, I can't really speak to the oil issues in the East. Um, I think there's only so much you can glean from a couple of weeks, to be honest. And I, th I think Mary would certainly give a, a more complete answer than I would. Um, you know, I don't know about the central bank. I didn't get the impression, speaking to people, that that was seen as a realistic uh, possibility. I mean, they spoke of a central bank um, being, uh, coming into existence in Benghazi at the time of the revolution. Um, and it hasn't really materialized or sustained itself over a longer period. Um, so I think Tripoli is very much seen as the center for our central banking. Um, they do have their branches around the country, 
um, and its reputation has been damaged by the recent robbery of, I think, 53 million outside one of their branches. Um, um, I don't know what the longer term um, reputation issue is after that robbery, uh, but I still I think Tripoli is very much seen as the <coughs> center. Um, would you like to answer the question that was asked directly to you about the what happened in Tripoli? Uh, the militias in Tripoli. Um, th th you're talking about Misrata's one in particular. Yes, I wanted to be sure it was a turning point for the that Well, it, it is a turning point, yes, and uh, it's the uh, the militias in the cities are not wanted anymore because. Some of their members ca have caused a lot of um, disorder, and but in general, a large number of them are real um, revolutionaries who fought in the fronts and and protected the country at some point. Uh, I believe personally that them leaving the city is the right thing, but not just Misrata, even other militias from other other uh, towns. Um, what happened in that particular incident and the deaths that about 43 people died and around 450 or 500 uh, injured was a mistake and the there it needs to be investigated but the news that are uh, going around is or the uh, info that we received is there were fights, there were shooting from both sides, and I personally believe that there must have been a third part uh, that has infiltrated and caused this. And this happens all the time. In, uh, there are so many who are, are armed and should have been put back in jail because they were released during the revolution. Around 16,000 prisoners were released to fight against the, uh, the revolution, but they joined the revolutionaries. Some of them have martyred. Some of them joined the police forces and the army forces. And, um, and that's the mistake. That's what shouldn't have happened. I believe that some of these returned back to their old habits, basically. Yes, they fought at the front, but then they were criminals from the start. So they became back, they went back to their old uh, business. And that's uh, what caused all the deaths. Uh, the reaction of the of both sides was completely, um, uh, of course, uh, exaggerated, and that's what led to the deaths. Coming back to your question, yes, it is the right thing to do, and I think it's a, it's a turning point, and in in Libyan history in general, and it should happen in all towns, not just in Tripoli. What do you think? Well, I had a discussion recently, actually, with a, a Libyan friend of mine, and I made the point that we've heard the expression turning point so often in Libya over the last year in relation to several different incidents. And earlier this year, there was another incident in Benghazi um, involving the, the Libya Shield um, armed group, which is a quasi-official um, group uh, tasked with providing security <coughs> in Benghazi. And uh, basically, there was a confrontation between uh, protesters outside its base, and uh, several people were killed. Again, people asked at that point, was this a turning point, and it proved not to be the case. I think, going back to what I said earlier, I think that in recent weeks we've just seen a just this, um, uh, so many different incidents. We had the abduction of the Prime Minister Ali Zaydan, um, we had the, the killing of the, the protesters in, in Tripoli a couple of weeks ago, and now, earlier this week, the incident in Benghazi. And I think it's creating this, um, just this momentum, that basically a perfect storm where people are saying, enough, we've been calling for the militias to leave the city, we've, uh, cities, we've been calling for the militias to be disbanded, but things have reached a tipping point. And that's certainly what I'm hearing from a lot of Libyans that they feel that this is a turning point. But there is um, one thing to say, though, about the departure of uh, some of the, the armed groups from, from Tripoli in terms of the Misratan armed groups. Um, the fallout from the Misratan side, remember that uh, when those armed groups returned to Misrata, um, they were uh, welcomed. They were actually handed sweets and, and roses. They were welcomed like heroes. Um, Misrata, the local councillor Misrata, uh, requested that all of its uh, members in the National Congress withdraw from the National Congress, 
and all its members in, in cabinet. So Misrata did not like the fact that its uh, militias left Tripoli. And that's something that is going to be some kind of spoiler, I think, in this, because what Misrata decides to do long term, and last week a, a delegation from the, the GNC, the National Congress, went to Misrata to ask them uh, to reconsider the, um, their decision to withdraw from the National Congress um, and uh, apparently they got, I was told, relatively short shrift. So that's something I think that's going to be problematic for some time to come. Yeah, may I add something mm -hmm. to this? See, the way the Musrata has left was offensive, really. The way they felt kicked out of the city where uh, most of them felt they are protecting the city. And of course, because of the fights they, they had during the revolution and the bravery they showed during the revolution, it was quite humiliating for the real um, warriors. Not the, I'm not talking about the small number of those who responded back in a very uh, exaggerated way, but in general, a lot of them are actually there protecting Tripoli, and in their minds, they are thinking, if we move out of Tripoli, who will be there to protect it? So um, I, I personally thought the way they were received wasn't right because of many who have died, 43 people died. But in general, it was done to sort of um, um, to reduce the humiliation and feeling in, uh, among the, the ones who have, um, who haven't done anything wrong in general. But I believe they should have taken the ones who have committed these crimes mm -hmm. and uh, sort of taking them to court or done something about it, not to take them all as, um, uh, or receive them all as heroes. But I, uh, personally, I, I think the way they left city, the city was uh, very, very offensive. Afterwards, the uh, celebrations that were made, um, they are all brothers at the end of the day, Tripoli or Musrata. I believe all this will pass, but it will, the bad taste will remain. And it shouldn't have been done, managed, or you know. In my, in my sorry, just to add something. In my very brief um, experience of Libya, when I was there, there was a real tension against militias because of the drain on the public poor, public purse. And I got the impression that, well, the, the understanding from the, the people was that there are militias and they're interchanging members all the time, and they're claiming numerous salaries as, mm -hmm. as members of different militias, and that's where a lot of the anger against the militias was, that they're draining the public purse mm -hmm. and they're stopping projects being completed and they're stopping the allocation of funds. So I think to a degree there was that frustration that was being demonstrated last um, weekend. Can I ask all three of you, David, two questions about the, um, the property rights issue, um, which is, uh, seems to be very central. And one was a question about whether it's something that can be resolved constitutionally, another was a question of you know, more generally, do, 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 do any of the three of you want to take that? and, you know, speak to it? I uh, or or shall I ask, the, I can ask the audience as well, so. I was gonna put a question to the audience about it more than anything. And in, in terms of flow of funds, in terms of creating, or helping people, or helping banks to deploy their capital properly. Um, can, can lending take place in the absence of property rights? Um, and my, my thought was that, for example, you might have a microfinance industry, and you might get the government to come in and partially guarantee loans. And that would, that would form security for the banks in terms of, in the absence of collateral. I mean, is that a fanciful idea or what do you think? Um, Sorry. I'll, I'll let you have a good attitude. Do you want to answer that directly? Sure. Um, I've actually worked on this property rights issue in Libya from both before the revolution and after it. And it's so funny to hear you saying what you did because some of us remember when Hernando de Soto, mm. the famous Peruvian expert of the ILD, was called in by none other than Saif al-Islam to do exactly what you've just said, to undo the morass that the Green Book's anti-property rights position, you know, el bet lil sakinihi, as you could essentially say, that what that has done to the Libyan property rights situation is meant that it's worse than South American countries that just had no title. Rather, there is a, a deliberate obfus obfuscation where in many cases three or four people may have claimed to a, a certain piece of land. I like what you said of having a fudge. You know, lending 
based on the idea that the person sitting in that house will be treated as the holder of the rights for it being used as collateral. And that's essentially what the Hernando de Soto ILD perspective was going to be. And when, whenever I get asked by academics, there's some USAID projects on the ground in Tripoli working on this, we all say, actually, you can't solve property rights first. Uh, as Lorianne said, it needs to be tackled in the Constitution, and certainly after there's a legitimate government. But you could, if there wasn't the whole hurdle of the Islamic banking, start lending immediately now <coughs> based on fudging and pushing into abeyance a final status on property rights, getting credit flowing based on the use of these things as collateral now. But sadly, there's no appetite for that because that solution is associated with Saiful Islam's reforms. So there are yet other complexities to the property issue that people tend not to bring out. And that's why, in my view, I mean, I could be wrong, but I'm just speculating. That's why the government is so slow to move on these property rights issues because it's tied up in some of the legacies of Saif and Jabril and Hernando de Soto and all of these whole super characters who are no longer considered acceptable to mention in polite company in Libya. Uh, in short, I think Lorianne is right. It's going to have to be a constitutional yeah. solution, and we're going to have to have fudge it mm -hmm. until that point. I hope that clarifies this question. Did you want to say something on that same issue? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll sign off. Uh, Fayouz Abdelhadi, it's Mark. Uh, you mentioned I work for an, a global bank, but I'm here in a personal capacity. Uh, I wanted to address the issue of property rights, uh, but I think we're missing a lens of analysis, and, and to your point about how do we read Libya and how do we help Libya. Uh, the lens of analysis that's missing is that uh, Libya is not Iraq, Libya is not uh, South America, uh, Libya is not Algeria, it's not Egypt, it's not Tunisia. Libya is Eastern Europe. And we're missing that lens of analysis completely. It's emerging as one of the last close to communist countries in the world. Um, and property rights, in my view, is really a symptom of the various things that are wrong in Libya. Uh, and I'll explain why. So if you look at the Eastern European experience with property rights, uh, to, a, to a question that was posed earlier, it, it took them 30 years to resolve this. It, it's not quite as easy as uh, fudging it or not putting everywhere. loans. But yeah. Pardon me? Not everywhere, but anyway. No, not everywhere, no, that's right. Um, but even 20 years, we're, we're still talking in, in decade terms. Uh, and the reason that it took so long is that property rights needs to be resolved in the context of a uh, national reconciliation as part of a dialogue. So property rights in Libya, I think, are particularly sensitive as a topic because it's not just the, the association with solutions of the previous regime. I, it's, we're talking about families here. You know, my grandfather's properties were taken, therefore we had to leave the country, therefore the entire legacy of the family has changed, our future, everything that we know and love has been taken from us. So there's a real open wound there uh, that we can't talk about just in economic terms. And for this reason, and the, the countries in Eastern Europe that have been successful uh, in resolving their property restitution issues had various things going for them. One was they had a real national reconciliation dialogue happening with very senior support, the political will to have those difficult conversations. People in communities were allowed to engage uh, and have those clashes and those conversations. So the kind of Misrata versus Sirt versus Benghazi conversations that are not happening now, those, need, those wounds need to be opened up uh, and that conversation needs to take place. Um, uh, in addition to that, what they had is uh, support uh, from foreign powers. So the U.S. took a, a, a big interest in the Jewish property restitutions. And that set a precedent for the other property restitutions to take place as well. Because if your you know, Jewish neighbor got his house back uh, on the basis of some kind of law, then you could also be eligible. Um, and also from the EU. So when the EU project started, there was um, a kind of a, a teaser. If you, if you, get, if you get this uh, issue resolved, we will allow you to apply to the EU. And this is something that Libya doesn't have. There's nobody telling us you will have access to you know, X billion of trade if you resolve this issue. We just don't have that. So, uh, and this is, uh, there's no question here, it's really just a point to say, we need to apply this lens of analysis. We need to begin to look at the parallels with Eastern Europe. Um, we need a national reconciliation dialogue to take place. There was an initiative started last week by Prime Minister Zidane uh, on national dialogue. It was behind closed doors, which is the exact wrong thing to do <laughs> when you're talking about dialogue. Um, 
uh, and so we need to look at those parallels and realize that it will take decades to the point that was made. It will take decades to, to resolve property restitution. And before that's the case, there are solutions for lending, but we'll never see the economic growth if those uh, conversations are not being had. So just the point I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, will, I will take, I think, two or three questions or, or comments, and then we'll let everybody conclude. Um, there's one per very persistent in the back. There, I think two may be persistent in the back, and, and then you, sorry. Hello, my, my name is Kambar Sainbo. Um, I'm from the Foreign Office, head of the uh, FCO Libya unit. Uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, my first comment is just picking up on what the speakers just said now. I think uh, the point made about looking at Libya through a generational prism is spot on. You've had about four decades of uh, Gaddafi uh, to deal with, and the symptoms of that are uh, evident uh, throughout of all of Libya that we see, in particular, a lack of state institutions and a serious level of mistrust between people and state institutions. And that will take time and it will require a degree of strategic patience, and we, shouldn't, we should not forget that. So I don't want to detract from the problems that Libya is facing, but if you look at how Libyans are coping with it, it is quite remarkable insofar as a checklist of challenges that Libya faces, ranging from arms and ammunition, lack of one state security structure. The Libyans are actually remarkably resilient and doing relatively well. I don't want to detract from the problems, but in, in any other situation, uh, the, the context could be a lot worse. But my one question is, on the issue of political will and national reconciliation, uh, I'm, I'll be grateful for the thoughts of the panel, but also from the audience, what role, if any, does the international community help have, and in particular, neighboring countries, to encourage a, a degree of cohesion around one political process, be it the national dialogue or anything else? Um, right there, another. One other final comment. I'm Dominic Asquith. I, I was ambassador till last year out in Egypt. Now I do a variety of consultancies. Uh, it's slightly surreal, this, in some ways, because next week we went to be in uh, Tripoli with a group of financial sector specialists, but uh, for two reasons. One, we couldn't persuade enough people to go out. And secondly, wasn't quite sure who to talk to. Uh, that's been postponed. Um, in answer to to Kanba's uh, point, um, in terms of uh, reconciliation, tackling some of the really hard questions in the context of a national dialogue, surely that's the role of the UN, uh, and it should be put on notice that that is a role it is expected to perform. Uh, I suspect, and Dr. Hamrush will have her views about this, I suspect it will require uh, a galvanizing force from outside the current stalemated political structures to get that national dialogue going in any meaningful sense, which takes me to the question, to Dr. Hamrouge, and the subject of the, uh, initially we started with, which was why it takes so long for the economy to, to recover, uh, we are still left with the reality that in the short term, the economy is going to be dependent upon government spending. And what uh, prevented the economy recovering up till now is, to put it very bluntly, the inability of government, by which I mean prime minister and ministers, to take decisions and implement them. They weren't solely at fault themselves for those two failures. Uh, it was partly the way that the political structures, by which I mean parliament, uh, try to usurp a whole lot of executive powers. But fundamentally, it comes down to decisions at the center and implementing. So the question is, what could the international community have done otherwise to have forced a government to take decisions and implement? OK, one, yeah, really sorry, but just, just one more. Um, oh, dear. <laughs> I'm going to have to just guess. Uh, back row, we'll have another another woman in the back. I, yeah. I'm getting a bit confused. This, I'm Sylvia Stevens from Faction Films, and we've been making two films in Libya. And one of the ones is on um, high-end horses. So we've been dealing with the agricultural ministry. 
One of the things which puzzles me, and maybe you all know, but in the agricultural ministry, they could only make s uh, decisions for like six months. They had all of these restrictions because we were trying to get a stud book and it was two million and they couldn't go over certain amounts. Now if that's, maybe it's just for the agricultural ministry, but if that's in the banking and in all the other aspects of the ministries, that's part of the problem. And they couldn't do it till they got the constitution. They couldn't right. do the constitution till they got security. I, I'll, I can take one other. I've just been told I'm allowed to go over a little bit. So there are two right here. Let's have you two on the aisle and then next person. Um, <laughs> uh, Noel Gakian, former British diplomat, served twice in Libya during the Gaddafi era. Um, I'm now director of the Middle East Association. Um, it is uh, on decision making, so there is actually now a, um, a thread in common with the questions, and that is, Mark, how did you find decision making? Because the legacy of that um, awful mantra that I've, I've remembered twice in Libya, le gène fi kulal meken, seems to me, which is committees everywhere, is that decision making is made or not made. And, and, and secondly, actually, as a, a slightly f um, more interesting point as well, is um, on banking in general, um, is there still theft and asset stripping that goes back to the time of the revolution that it has still to be resolved? Okay, final, final brief comment, and then I'll let each of you choose which of those final issues you want to respond to. Roger Hardy, I'm a journalist. Um, when Gaddafi fell, Britain, France, and the United States were wildly popular. Are they still? <laughs> okay, so each of you who choo may choose one or two of those points to respond to in your final minute. So I'll go backwards. Uh, we'll start with Mark. I'm going to be very predict predictable <laughs> and answer Noel's question. Um, everyone said that what's stopping decisions being made is this formulation of committees, um, particularly when it came to spending on infrastructure projects. They didn't know, they, they wanted to analyze the project, but they wanted to do it via committee. And then that committee would take a long time to decide whether they were actually going to spend the money. So I, I think this was coming through the Financial Affairs Committee. And when it came to the disbursement of money. So the central bank would allocate the funds, and then the funds would sit for a long time in the committees. So that was definitely seen as a way of delaying decisions. And I think this is more uh, reflective. Uh, certainly in Iraq, it was the same, that no one wanted to take the risk of making the decision in case the investment didn't work out. Um, so it just pushed it down the line. Um, there was no mention of asset stripping um, as to whether it's still going on or not. So I, I can't really answer that one, I'm afraid. Now, um, thanks, Dominic, for the question. Um, see, decision-making is not the real problem. The ministers were able to make decisions, but how to implement those decisions was the real issue. I'll give you an example. For example, there are lots of, as I mentioned earlier, many projects that we have reviewed from the previous regime, and we wanted to uh, let them make them up and running, basically finish them. Uh, the first decision would be the minister, minister's deci decision to agree on that project, that particular project to be done, all right? At the end, it has to go through many steps. And even when it's agreed upon by the ministry itself, it has the budget for that particular project is either at the Ministry of Finance or Ministry of Planning, <coughs> depending on what uh, it's not in the ministry itself. And then it needs a, uh, an approval from the Minister of uh, um, Finance or the Minister of Planning. And again, before even forward it, forwarding it to the, uh, one of these two ministers, it has to go through the General Auditor's Office. Anything that is over, uh, at my time, anything that's over half a million is no longer in the, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the particular minister can't make any decision. And it has to go to the other two ministers be and being <coughs> approved by the, uh, gener by the gener general auditor's office first. Now it has inc been increased to two million, and that's what uh, you have mentioned in the, uh, in the Ministry of um, uh, Agriculture. <laughs> it's because of the new government <coughs> that has raised this, uh, um, 
to, to, to two million rather than half a million. Uh, it takes a long time for the auditor's office to accept or to approve the project. And it goes back and forth to the ministry. And then once it's approved by the auditor, it goes to the ministry of whatever, you know, either uh, fi uh, finance or uh, planning. And that, of course, at particularly during our term, it was only eight months. Many of these projects, by the time we reached eight months, we have gone and they had to restart them again. So the period was very uh, short and the um, bureaucracy was really um, not for uh, a government that has to act fast. The, re the rules and regulations remain the same, haven't been changed. So that's what blocked our um, ability to implement our decisions Mind you, some have been done, but with a real big push and personal uh, effort by uh, any minister. I, I hope this answers your question, Dominic. Mary, final word. <coughs> well, the two issues I wanted to um, just come back to with the reconciliation issue, somebody else brought up the issue of reconciliation, the questions. And reconciliation in, in Libya is so multifaceted and and so prickly. If you look at some of the efforts that have um, taken place over the last year, some of them behind the scenes, there have been efforts to reach out, for example, or to reconcile with former regime uh, officials or the families of former regime officials outside Libya. And when those efforts became public, it basically blew up uh, in the faces of those involved in those efforts. And, uh, and it showed how sensitive this, this issue is. Um, Reconciliation Libya, there are obviously legacy issues like the property issue we discussed um, earlier, but there are also legacy issues in terms of how Gaddafi um, manipulated, if you like, the, the tribal dynamics um, in, in Libya, played different regions or towns against each other, and we see some of those conflicts continuing today. There are also reconciliation issues as a result of what happened in 2011. Um, one particular issue I consider a, a running sore in, in Libya is the issue of the town of Tawarga, which is the town close to the city of Misrata. Um, and I remember visiting it back in early 2012, and it's, the town is deserted because the inhabitants of that town were seen as pro-Gaddafi. They were accused by Misratans of carrying out uh, crimes in Misrata during the uprising, um, and they have not been allowed back to, to the town. Um, and Misratans will tell you they will never be allowed back. Several Misratans have said to me, we're rich enough to build a new Tawarga down in southern Libya and they can go and live there. So that issue is still very, very sensitive and shows no uh, signs of being addressed anytime soon despite the efforts of, of some uh, political um, forces. The other thing I wanted to go back to uh, Roger's question about um, foreign actors in, in Libya and how they're perceived now. And as you pointed out, Britain, the US, and, and France were, were seen as, as heroes, um, I guess, in, in 2011. I remember um, in, in Benghazi and the support <coughs> for, for France in Benghazi was quite extraordinary. I was there, I was in Benghazi when David Cameron um, and Nicolas Sarkozy visited um, in early 2012. And it was very, very interesting to see the reception they got there. You had stadiums in Benghazi being named after Sarkozy, cafes being named after Sarkozy. I have to say though, in, in my more recent visits, I do detect um, a change in mood. There is uh, creeping in now a suspicion of, um, of foreign uh, actors in, in Libya, a sense, a questioning of, of uh, different countries and their agenda, their motives in Libya, whether this is uh, to do with an economic agenda or a political agenda. Um, there is a sense growing that certain external actors are supporting certain political forces uh, in the country, and that is uh, all tied up in the, the political entanglement there. Also, if you look at the fallout from uh, the US capture of Abu Anas al-Libi, who's currently on, on trial in the US um, some time ago, the fallout from that, I was quite struck uh, by the number of Libyans I spoke to who were not uh, in any way sympathetic to Abu Anas al-Libi or his ideas or his, his background or history, but that they felt that this, the nature of his capture uh, was a violation of, uh, of Libya's sovereignty. Um, so again, it feeds into, I'm, I think there's still remains 
goodwill towards most external actors in Libya, but certainly I detect this uh, suspicion uh, creeping in more recently. Can I ask you, does that mean, because there were a couple of questions about could an outside impulse help create national reconciliation, help create this, um, you, know, uh, the, you know, the basis for a legitimate government, does that mean there's no role for the UN or for the European Union or for an outside power to come in and help uh, you know, uh, even just spark or inspire a kind of um, solidification? No, I, I think, as I said, the, this suspicion that's creeping in, it's, it's not widespread. I, what I've been struck by in, in recent months is actually the number of Libyans who are saying now that while after um, October 2011, there was a sense Libyans were saying, we can do this alone, we can manage our transition ourselves, and the international community, to an extent, was rather hands off. There are several Libyans now that are saying it should have been different. It should have been done differently. There should have been more international support at an earlier stage. Would you, you agree, agree with that? that? Yeah, I do. I do. I think we needed and we still need uh, more experts from international uh, community. And they would be accepted and they would be Yes, welcomed. if they are fully foreigners, if they are not. Because they, we have a problem now with the Libyans having dual citizenship, they are not accepted in Libya in, at, at a wide scale. You, we were talking about it earlier. Um, if, in general, they would accept uh, uh, an expert who comes with... Who's seen as neutral. Seen as neutral, neutral yeah. And also, <coughs> we ha in, in, as a foreigner, basically coming to do a job and leave. But if they are, for example, me, I had, or I have two mm -hmm. citizenship, Irish and, and Libyan. Uh, a lot have frowned upon that, and uh, I believe it's because during the deafest time, most people who were who took a separate uh, or another additional citizenship were against the government, and they were looked at as traitors and all the sort of names. So it's become part of the general um, opinion, actually. Uh, People don't trust much. They think you are coming here to serve your mm -hmm. second country. But if you are fully not Libyan at all from a different, they you you gain more more trust. Of course, so Mark, you, you were not Libyan. How how were you? <laughs> how, how, were, how were you received? Well, I think there's a, a good predisposition towards the Irish, which is very helpful. <laughs> and I, was, and I, was, I was going to say it in, in my talk. Um, I think I was in the the Radisson Blue Hotel one evening and. Um, I was looking for an internet code, and I heard these very strong North Dublin accents in the background. I was like, God Almighty. So I, I shouted out, where are you from? And these three lads came out, and they were three brothers from the same family who would all come over from, I think they were living they were in the north side of Dublin somewhere, but they were coming over with their parents who were living, and they'd been there for the last two years. Um, so we just chatted, but I got the overwhelming impression that they were looking forward to going back to Ireland. Um, but on the, on the dual nationality, <laughs> <laughs> they were, well, Emphasizing, emphasizing um, the doctor's point, but um, on the very quickly, on, on the subject of dual nationality, um, with regards to the central bank, um, an uh, uh, advertisement went out for a new central bank governor, and it's explicitly stated that applicants with dual nationality need not apply. So it's, it's become a real issue, and because that means you're going to have a serious amount of experts who have gained, Libyans who have gained experience abroad, feeling they can't come back. So yeah. um, the fact that it's been sort of promulgated by the officials is quite That's worrying. Right. Thank you very much. I appreciate um, all of your comments and, and, and uh, very, very grateful to the three excellent panelists. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.